holy behavior in an unholy world. Holy behavior in an unholy world. 1 Peter chapter 1, I'll begin reading verse 14. I'll read down through verse 19. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So if I was to ask this morning, are you holy? What would you think? What would, you, what would you answer? And what do you think when you think of a holy person? You know, we use words sometimes, but we don't define them. What is a holy person? Is a holy person that person maybe who sits with their legs crossed, humming and meditating all day long? Is, is that a holy person? It is, is a holy person, when you envision a holy person, do you think of a Mother Teresa type person? Somebody who sells everything they have, moves in, and lives with lepers in India? Or perhaps your uh, definition of holiness is somebody who don't. You know, somebody who don't smoke, drink, or chew, or kiss those who do. Uh, maybe, maybe that's a holy person. So then... What is a holy person? And then, when you think of holy, do you ever ask yourself, the Bible commands me to be holy, and yet there is temptation everywhere. How can I be holy in this world where temptation to sin and to compromise what the Word of God says, how can I be holy when sin lures me and the desires of the flesh and the sins of our culture are so tempting and everywhere I turn, everybody seems to be compromising what is right and, and, and how can I be holy? Well, the text says for us to be holy. And you say, how can I be holy? Well, that's what I want to talk about this morning is holy behavior in an unholy world. I want you to notice first off the context. Notice the context of Peter's writing. The context is in verse 17, the last part. And notice what he says there. The time of your stay on the earth. That sets us a textual context for what he's talking about here. And the backdrop of 1 Peter, the backdrop, if you will, is the Old Testament exodus. You know, when the children of Israel came out of Egyptian bondage. And Peter uh, is using that as a backdrop for the New Age Christian or the Christian of the New Age who is now leaving the world of sin. He calls them in verses 1 and 2 of 1 Peter, uh, aliens and strangers scattered abroad. And then notice the phrase, the time of your stay on earth. The Greek word for stay means sojourner. It is the same word used to describe the children of Israel who lived in the Egyptian bondage. In Acts 13 verse 17, it says, The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. It's the only other place, it's only used three times, that word stay, three times in the New Testament. And it always refers to the time when the, when the Old Testament Jews were in the Egyptian bondage. And so Peter's readers, like the children of Israel in the Old Testament, had come out of a culture. The, the culture that they had come out of was a, was a mixture of various people and cultures with very different backgrounds. Uh, 
the portion of scripture here that Peter quotes to us when he says God is holy therefore you be holy comes out of a section of the book of Leviticus called the holiness code. It's called the holiness code. And it goes from Leviticus chapter 11 all the way to chapter 20, the end of chapter 20. And scholars have called that the holiness code because of the repeated use of the word holy throughout. It's the part of the holiness code where God lays down the behaviors for the children of Israel so that they could be distinct and set apart as they sojourned through the wilderness to the promised land. In other words, as pilgrims and strangers, the children of Israel were to be holy in all their behavior. They were supposed, I'm sorry, they were not supposed to live like, act like, eat like, dress like, or worship like any of the pagans that surrounded them. They were to be distinct. They were to be holy. And notice what Peter does. He addresses his readers as obedient children. Obedient children. Now, at this point, we need to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be a child of God? How can you be a child of God? Because you see, these days that we live in, everybody thinks they're a child of God. Everybody thinks just by virtue of physical birth, they are the sons and daughters of God. But the Bible teaches not so. The Bible teaches that before we're saved, we are sons of disobedience, according to Ephesians chapter 2, and children of wrath. In Ephesians 5, 6, it says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons or children of disobedience. A person is not a child of God by virtue of physical birth. Jesus said, you must be born again. Peter said in this, this chapter 1, verse 3, he said that uh, we, according to God's great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Christians, children of God, are those people who have experienced the new birth. Now, everybody in here, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to say you're all real nice people. I'm going to say you're some of the greatest people on planet Earth. I'm going to go ahead and say you're some of the best neighbors anybody could ever have. As far as I know, there's not a lawbreaker or a reprobate in here. But that doesn't change the fact that you're a sinner. That doesn't change the fact that God's Word said you must be born again. And until you're born again, you are not a child of God in the biblical sense. Christians are born again children of obedience. Christians are pilgrims and strangers who are temporarily staying on this earth. Christians are people who are liberated by the precious blood of Jesus Christ from the power of sin. And now we have escaped or have been liberated from our own personal Egyptian bondage. And we are on our way to the heavenly promised land. Christians are people who struggle with the memory of their former lust, according to verse 14. Christians are uh, like the Hebrews of old. Peter's readers are like we are today. We have inherited a feudal way of life from our forefathers, according to verse 14. Now, the context that Peter was writing to was a culture of Roman paganism. Roman paganism is the exact opposite of Christianity in just about every way. It is the moral opposite of Christianity. Roman paganism was polytheistic, meaning they worshipped all kinds of gods. They had a lot of gods. And they celebrated many of their gods and worshipped their gods with drunkenness and orgies of all kinds of perversions. 
And then there were people in Peter's church that came out of what's known as esoteric Judaism, a, a kind of a spiritual version of Judaism, much like what we would call the New Age movement today. They thought they would uh, 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 evolve into some god when they died. And, and, and can you imagine what Peter's church was like that he's writing to? you got these people that used to be slaves. Some of them were slave owners. Some of them came out of Roman paganism and debauchery and drunkenness. Some of them came out of mystical, esoteric Judaism. And all of these people are glummed together in one church. Can you imagine what a business meeting was like <laughs> in that outfit? Can you imagine the different preferences they all had? Can you imagine the discussions that took place in their Sunday school classes? Can you imagine maybe what a worship service was like in that context? Well, that's the context. Now I want you to notice the command. Notice the command. As obedient children, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. This command, Peter commands this hodgepodge group of spiritual and emotional shipwrecks to live holy in all their behavior. Now I'm going to tell you, I was reading through this and as I read the culture and read the background from which they came, it suddenly dawned on me that if God expected them to live holy, he does us as well. It was no harder for them to live holy than it is for us, and it's no harder for us than it was for them. Be ye holy, for I am holy. God expects us to live holy lives. So what does it mean to be holy? Very simply, the word holy means to be set apart. It means separated. Their synonyms for holiness is sanctify, consecrate, or sacred. Be holy. Now, holy is, is what God is. God is holy. Now, God is holy in a way that you and I can never be holy. Now, I want to say that again. God is holy in a way that you and I can never be holy. God is the definition of holiness. You know, if you look in the dictionary, and a lot of times when you look up words, there's a picture of what it is beside it. Well, if you looked up holiness, if there were to be a picture of God, it would be right there. But there is no picture of God. So when you think of God, you think of holiness. When you think of holiness, you think of God. God is holy both in essence and in action. God is holy from within. God's motive is holy and everything that God does is holy. God does not sin nor can God be tempted to sin. God has not nor will God ever violate his holiness. There is nothing on this earth to compare with the absolute holiness of God. Nothing. You've never seen anything. You've never experienced anything. You've never been anywhere. You'll never see anything in this world that compares to the pure, unadulterated holiness of Almighty God. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3, Isaiah was in the temple and all of a sudden God showed up. And Isaiah said, woe is me. For I'm undone, I'm a man with unclean lips. And the cherubim were there and the seraphim and the, the place began to rock and roll. And he said there were these creatures around the throne of God and each one called out to the other and they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. In the book of Revelation you see a similar scene. In the book of Revelation, uh, John is escorted up around the throne and there he sees a heavenly host surrounding the throne. And there's these weird creatures that we don't know anything about. They got four faces and eyes and wings and oh, it's just out of this world. 
And they are there giving glory to God. And what are they saying? Well, they're certainly not sitting there saying, all you need is love. No, 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 no. That's not what they're saying. Revelation chapter 4 verse 8 says, And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord the Almighty who was and is and who is to come. God is holy. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 4. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name for you alone are holy. God is holy. And because God is holy, everything God does is holy. God's word is holy. God's word is holy. Now this has come under uh, criticism in our culture today. A lot of people think that the word of God is a document of people and men put together down through the years and in the final analysis, what they believe is, is that people created God instead of God creating people. The Word of God is infallible, inerrant, without mixture of error. Because it is God-breathed, the Bible says. All Scripture is given by inspiration. The word inspiration means God-breathed. When you hold up this Bible, you are holding the Holy Word of God. So, uh, Romans chapter 7 and verse 12 says, The law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. God's name is holy. You ever thought about that? God's name is holy. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. We don't take the Lord's name in vain. That means to use it in a useless, derogatory, worthless way to deface the name of the Lord. You see, in the Old Testament, a person's name was a synonym for the person. To take the word, the person's name in vain is to curse the person himself. To take the Lord's name in vain is to talk bad about God. In Matthew chapter 9, I'm sorry, chapter 6, verse 9, in the uh, Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, Pray then in this way. And the first thing he said to say was, Our Father who is in heaven, Hallowed be your name. That word hallowed means holy, sacred, sanctified, sacred. Now I want you to understand something about that. When Jesus said, say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed or sacred or holy is not an adjective in that phrase. When we say, hallowed be thy name, we are not describing God's name. In the sentence, the word, the word hallowed, sacred, holy is a verb. So what's Jesus saying there? Jesus is saying, when you get out on your knees to pray and you say, our Father who art in heaven, you are to hallow his name. That's what we do, not what we say. Why? Because his name is holy. And because his name is holy and we belong to him, we are to be holy ourselves in all of our behavior. God's people should behave holy. Hebrews 12, 14, Paul, or the writer of Hebrews says... Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That's a very emphatic statement. The command, un be holy, makes me uneasy. As a matter of fact, as I sat down to uh, interact with this, with this passage of Scripture and I knew I had to preach on holiness, something in me said, you can't do that. You just can't do that. Who in the world do you think you are to stand up and tell other people to be holy when you know how you are? Hey, listen, I don't want you to think I'm something I'm not. I'm just like you are. And you know how that is, right?
Our own sin nature keeps pulling at us. And the world keeps holding out temptations. And even if you're born again, we continue to struggle against sin. So how can we be holy? You know, the Apostle Paul struggled with that same thing. In Romans chapter 7, in verse 18, you almost hear Paul in a, in a plea of desperation. Listen to what he says in verse 18. Paul says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for the, for the willing is present in me. That is, I've got this desire to do right. The willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Can you relate? I got all these plans, but I got very little action. And he says, for the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. He says, but I am doing the very thing that I do not want. I am no longer the one doing it, but sin that dwells in me. And he says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. I, 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 I'm right there, I'm saying amen, Paul. Then how in the world can we be holy if that's the way we are? And Paul's acknowledging his struggle and at the bottom of the text in verse 24, Paul in exasperation, uh, he continues and this is what he says. Paul says in verse 24, oh wretched man that I am. You ever look in the mirror in the morning and say, you wretch, you wretch. Did you ever get down in your quiet time before God and say, God, I am a wretch. I am a wretch. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. How can you be holy? Paul cries out, he says, Who will set me free from the body of this death? Put another way, Paul says, I've got a dead body hanging around my neck and I can't get it off. Gross. And then Paul utters the answer, and it's so simple. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. Hallelujah. I don't have to do it for myself. He does it for me. Hallelujah. Paul said it's through Jesus Christ. Jesus sets us free from this body of death. Jesus makes us holy. The Bible says, talks about imputation. That is, Jesus takes his holiness and he imputes it to our account. And he takes our sins and imputes it to his account. That's what it means in 2 Corinthians 5, 21 when it says, God made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The balances have switched. He became me and I became him. That's how we get made holy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, Paul says, From him you are in Christ Jesus, who for us became wisdom from God as well as righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. The word sanctification is a synonym for holiness. God imputes our sin to Jesus' account and God imputes Jesus' holiness to us and so that God then makes us holy, set apart for his use. That is our position. But now notice Peter is talking about our practice. God has made us holy through redemption, but what Peter is talking about is living out what God has done in your life. Peter is talking about in, 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 in being holy, holy behavior. Skip back up to verse 2, if you will, of chapter 1. And notice that, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, notice this, by the sanctifying, that's holifying, if you will, by the holifying work of the Holy Spirit. The holifying work or the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit 
is to enable or empower us to behave as obedient children of God. The Holy Spirit is at work in us to help us as obedient children to be holy in all of our behavior. That's what Peter's saying. Now you got to remember the context and the background. It's the Exodus. Holiness in the Old Testament, it meant acting different. It meant being different from the pagan culture that surrounded them. Those children of Israel, those Hebrews who came out of Egypt, they, they were supposed to behave different from everybody around them. Now what that meant was they were supposed to eat different food. You ever read the Old Testament and read the book of Leviticus? You can eat goat not cooked in its own mother's milk and all this weird stuff. And you're thinking, what? You probably skipped that book because it's real weird and boring. This was the holiness code. They were to eat different. They were to dress different. They were to talk different. They were to worship one God instead of multiple gods. And beloved, listen. If you read about the Old Testament Jews, what you'll learn is it was easier for God to get them out of Egypt than it was for God to get Egypt out of them. Because they were plagued with the passions and lust of their former ignorance that they had inherited from their forefathers. That's exactly what he's telling us here. And by quoting the holiness code, Peter is alerting his readers that just like God expected them to live different, God expects you to behave different. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let's be honest about it. There are some behaviors, there are some behaviors that characterize the unchristian culture in which we live in that we need to be alert to and be on guard against so that we don't imitate that culture. For example, speech. One of the fastest ways I know to tell people or to communicate to people or to witness to people that I am not a Christian is to use the speech of the world. In other words, if you want people to think you're not saved, just talk like everybody around you. That's all you got to do. Just talk like, like filthy people do. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 4 says, There must not be filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, which is not fitting. So we ought not talk like the pagans around us. Another way that characterizes, another thing that characterizes lost is entertainment. Beloved, I want to say something here. I, I don't know whether you've thought about this or not. This may be revelation to you. If, if it is, then take it to heart, digest it, think about it all week. We can't engage in every bit of entertainment that comes down the pike. As God's people, there are some things that we have to say, no. I'm not doing that, I won't do that, I can't do that, because it's sinful entertainment. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3, the time is already past for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Now, I'm going to go through all those words, but I have one word there I want to point out to you. It's the word carousing, carousing. Let me read to you straight from the dictionary the definition from the Greek word that is komos, it, that is translated carousing. Listen to this. Carousing was a nocturnal and riotous possession, procession of half-drunken and frolicsome fellows who after supper parade through the streets with torches and music in honor of Bacchus or some other deity 
and sing and play before houses of male and female friends. Hence, use generally a feast and drinking parties that are protracted till late at night and indulge in revelry. Sounds to me like the opening of the tiki bar. And that is exactly what he says that we as God's people should abstain from. When's the last time you heard somebody say, I don't go to those kinds of events because it's carousing. I don't carouse. I don't go to rock concerts because it's carousing. I don't go to nightclubs where they have singing and drinking and dancing because that's carousing. It's unholy. That's why I don't do it. How about dress? We ought to dress differently. Now, I've stopped preaching and gone to meddling, but praise God, it's in the Word. Amen? Amen? When's the last time you heard a preacher say anything about the way people dress? You say, well, now, you don't want to offend nobody. Let me tell you something. When I was the pastor of another church, we had a stage that was about three times higher than this. And every Sunday morning, part of the morning service was we had some of our youth that would... That, 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 that would come up and read scripture and uh, they would come up they, 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 and they would go like this but the girls would have to go like this is that disgusting or what y'all want me to do it again y'all want me to do it again you didn't like it did you come on now it got so bad that we had to just stop it and then we had to put a phrase, I didn't want to say anything, cause, and, and I, had to put a, I had to put a little blurb in the bulletin and said, please dress in an appropriate fashion when you come to the house of God. And I had one lady come up to me and she said, now preacher, I'm just insulted. I don't think you should put things like that in the bulletin. Well, I'm just so nice I didn't say anything back to her, but I can tell you all what I thought. I thought, now here you are insulted at me for saying something when you ought to be insulted that somebody would stand up in the house of God half naked. Now listen, if a person doesn't know any better and they're fresh out of the pagan culture, I'm not going to criticize them. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about standards of holy conduct that befits people of God. And it's not just girls. Hey, listen, I went to a church league softball game right after I got saved, and some old boy got up there to bat, and when he did like that, he was pulling his shorts down because his cheeks were hanging out. Disgusting! <laughs> it's time we said it like it is, folks. God's people need to be decent. But you know what? Holiness is not just outward. Holiness is more than just outwardly keeping some rules. If holiness were a matter of outward rule keeping, the Pharisees would have been the holiest people of all. But Jesus criticized them harsher than anyone. He said in Matthew 23, Outwardly you appear as righteous to men, but inwardly you're full of dead men's bones. You see, holiness is not rule keeping. You know what holiness is? Holiness is Christ like behavior that springs forth from a heart that is purified by the precious blood of Christ and is consistently re energized by the Holy Spirit. Come on up there with that next one. Hit that clicker again. I want people to write that down. There you go. Holiness is Christ-like behavior that springs forth from a heart that is purified by the precious blood of Christ and is constantly re-energized by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Without holiness, no one will see God. Now, let's finish up because the context is during the time of your sojourn on earth. The command is, obedient children, be holy because I am holy. Now, I want you to see there's a conflict and then I'm, I'm finished. The conflict. There are three things in the text that, 
that fight against us. They are, make it difficult because the conflict is we know how God wants us to live, but sometimes we behave differently. The first one is this. We have a conflict with former lust. Do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. Former lusts are those cravings and desires and passions that control us in our ignorance before we were saved. Titus 3.3 says, You were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts. Before we were saved, we were all captivated by our cravings, our desires, and our passions. We couldn't control ourselves, is what Paul says. Peter says, do not be conformed, in verse 14, to those former lusts. Conform means fashioned. It means molded into an image. The Christian is to be conformed to the image of Christ, not to his former habits. Have you ever noticed how easily old habits can be rekindled and reinstated? Have you ever noticed that? Let me give you an example. I know this for a fact. That if you take a person, let's say they're an alcoholic, and they drink a fifth of whiskey a day. Let's say you got an alcoholic, he's drinking a fifth of whiskey a day. And he quits, and he stays quit for 10 years. Let's just suppose he falls off the wagon, and he starts drinking again. You know what? He doesn't start with a thimbleful. He, it, it, it'll, he'll start right back at a, at a fifth a day. That's the way it works. You take somebody that snorts cocaine, they might start off with a little bit, you know, a little dust here and there. Next thing you know, they're up to $2,000 a day <laughs> just doing it all over. Well, you know what? If they quit and they, they stay quit for five years and they start back, they don't start back with a taste. They start back right where they start. And that's the way it is with sin. Our old habits plague our minds and we think about them. You say, well, well, uh, uh, how do I overcome it? Listen, listen. If I had a problem with alcohol before I got saved, it is not very wise for me to stand outside the liquor store and witness. I, I, we must replace, we must replace our former lust with a righteous habit. For example, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22 he says, in reference to your former manner of life, lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceits, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness and in truth. You should replace lying with telling the truth. You should replace stealing with work and sharing with others. You should replace cursing and unwholesome communication with blessing and praising God. Be done with your old life. That's what Paul's saying. And replace something bad with something good. The great ex uh, explorer Cortez, he had a handful of men and a few ships. When he landed on the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, he wanted to capture the Aztec civilization that was many decades and centuries old and had untold wealth and many armies and, 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 and all he had. You know what he did? Cortez was a master motivator. He pulled all of his men up on the beach. He gathered around. He says, we are going to take this country for Spain. And then he said, burn the ships. Burn the ships. The only way we're getting back is on the wealth of what we take. Burn the ships. Nobody's going back. Nobody's going to retreat. Nobody's going to defect. Nobody's going back. Burn the ships. Listen, folks, in order for us to live holy in an unholy world, we need to burn some ships. Cut the cord. Don't go back. Don't even think about going back. The second thing is, we have a conflict because we forget the Father's judgment. He said there, if you address as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct or behave yourselves in fear. Now, up until this point in 1 Peter, Peter has mentioned 
the return of the Lord twice in verse 7 and verse 13. In both of those times, it's been a positive thing as a way to encourage people about their rewards. But here, it is a way to motivate fear, knowing that you may fail at the judgment of Christ. Now, how important are our works? Well, we're not saved by our works. Not, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Bible clearly says we are saved by Christ's work on our behalf, but our works determine our eternal rewards. Listen to what Jesus said, Matthew 6, 20. Jesus said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You see, all of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of our life. We're going to stand before God and we're going, to, we're going to either be presented rewards or we're going to suffer loss. At the judgment seat of Christ for Christians, it is not a place to determine whether we're saved or lost. We are saved the moment we trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but we will give an account of our works. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul said, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one, listen, may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, each man's work will be tested and they will be put in the fire. And some men will produce wood, hay, and straw which will only produce ashes. Others will be precious stone and gold, and that will be a reward. Paul says there's a possibility that at the judgment seat of Christ, some Christians will look back upon what their life has produced, and it will amount to a pile of ashes. What happens if we forget? During our sojourn, during our stay, we forget that we will give an account of our deeds and we begin to live selfishly, carelessly, and wastefully. We may suffer loss. We may be saved, but suffer loss of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Notice the text says, Our Father is an impartial judge. God is no respecter of persons. Our reputation will not impress God. The amount of money we made will not impress God. Our family tree will hold no bearing. Neither will the degrees or the awards that hang on our wall. All that's going to matter at the judgment seat of Christ is did I love my brethren and did I serve my Lord? That's all that's going to matter. Romans chapter 14 verse 12 says each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Let me just ask you a very pointed question. If you had to give an account of your life today, stand before Jesus Christ, the one who died on Calvary's cross, suffered, bled, and died for your redemption, and you're standing in front of him this morning, this day, before you go to bed tonight, you're, you're standing there. And the books were open. What is the most Impressive work that you have done for which you would be rewarded for. Do you have treasure in heaven? Or is it possible that you can stand before him with a Wasted life. And the fire of judgment reduces to a pile of ashes. Because you've lived worldly and not holy. Beloved, remembering that we will give an account of our works motivates us to behave holy in an unholy world. And then finally, there's a conflict caused by failing to appreciate our redemption. In verses 18 and 19, I'll not read them again, but Peter says that we've been redeemed. 
The word redemption means there's been a price paid. There's been a ransom paid for our redemption. Jesus said, I did not come to serve, but to, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom. In the biblical times, slaves had no rights. In order for a slave to be set free, somebody had to purchase that slave and then give him his freedom. That's the, that's the picture of ransom. That's the picture of redemption. Jesus Christ purchased us from the slave market of sin and then wrote in his blood our certificate of redemption. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And sometimes it's real easy for us, after we've been a Christian for a long time, to take for granted what God did for us. How many marriages do you think end because one or the other or both fail to appreciate the spouse? Let me just end by this little story. My wife and I know this very well, but when, when, when I went to Arkansas to marry my beautiful bride 30, 30 years ago. Uh, <laughs> we went there on a Friday night, and some of, my, some of my guys, you know, from Tennessee came over, and one old boy was going to be the best man in my wedding. And uh, we were sitting, we, we were talking that after rehearsal the night before the wedding, and he was t he'd been married for a while. I had never been married. My other two buds, well, they weren't married. And we were getting marital advice from him. He'd been married about four or five years. And uh, he said, Steve, he said, I'll tell you, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's awful. He said, the other day I came home from work and he said, she was sitting there all dressed up and everything. And he said, I didn't say a word about how she looked. He said, she went running out the front door and when she got to the front step, she tripped and landed in a mud hole. He said, and then she just laid there and cried. Well, I'm shocked. I had never been married. I didn't know this was normal. And I said, well, what was the problem? And he gave me some advice. He said, Steve, the romance was just gone out of our marriage. Sometimes uh, my wife says that to me. She says, Steve, the romance is just gone. The other night, she said, uh, she said, uh, why don't we have a date night? I said, all right, let's have one. Where are we going? She said, I'd like to just sit right here. I said, amen. <laughs> That's a date night for us. He said, the romance is just gone out of our, our marriage. That old boy, I, I tried to witness to him, tried to share Christ with him many times over many, many years. And he, he got into drugs and alcohol. and I lost touch with him a few years later. I, about, about 10 years ago, I called one day, asked him, could I come by and see him? He said, I don't, I don't have time. I just don't have time. So I hung up the phone, and I, I, told, I said, I, I don't know. I just, I, 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 well, about five years ago on Facebook, I'm looking at Facebook, and his wife had, had, and she showed a picture of him being baptized. And so I got in touch with him. And what I found out was, his, he got so bad off, his family had an intervention. Y'all know what an intervention is? An intervention is when all your loved ones gather around you and they say, if you keep this drinking up, we're going to cut you loose. And not only that, your behavior is killing us. You see, what had happened in his life was, what had happened in his life was, he had gotten to the point where he failed to appreciate all those people around him. He was taking it for granted that he could just use them any old way he pleased until they had an intervention. And they said, this stuff stops, and it stops now. And it woke him up. And now he's walking with the Lord. And last, last, last winter when we were over there, we met with him, and he seen, him and his wife just seemed like they're just so happy. What am I telling you that for? I'm telling you because, listen, it may be that this is an intervention for somebody here this morning. 
Because listen, it is very easy for us to forget that Jesus Christ paid precious blood for our redemption. And he says, all I want out of you is to live a holy life. Be different. Be distinct. Be a follower of Christ. Be my representative in this world. And be holy because I've called you to be holy. Maybe this morning you need a wake-up call. And you need to be reminded that you will give an account of your life before God. And you need, to, you need to step away from those former lusts that used to characterize your life. You're starting to slide back into them, and today you need to come to this altar and you need to say, God, restore my soul. I'm sorry you paid your precious blood for me and I've not been living like it, and today I want to ask you to forgive me and to renew my faith. Maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe this morning you need to come for salvation. Maybe you've never been saved, never been a child of God. You, you, you need to be born again. Maybe God's calling you for church membership. Or maybe you've been saved and you need to be baptized. We're going to give an invitation. And, and during this invitation, if God spoke to your heart for any reason, I want you to come. Would you stand with me? Bow your head and close your eyes this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we just pray. Musicians are fixing to come. And if you stood before Jesus Christ as a believer today, and he tries your works in the fire of judgment, what's going to be left? Are you living for Jesus? What are you living for? He is mercy. He is grace. He is kindness. He is compassion. And all he asks for us is to be willing and submissive and obedient. And dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as I preach these words today, my soul is convicted of how unholy and how unrighteous sometimes I am. God, we all need to be drawn closer to you. We ask today your grace just generally to be poured out upon this whole congregation. Help us, Lord, to hear your word today. Father, I pray that if there's one that's not saved, today would be the day of salvation. Father, maybe, maybe there's one here that needs to come home. They've fallen back into their former lusts. And the, and the appreciation for what Jesus did for them at the cross has faded to the background. And I just pray the Holy Spirit would do a divine intervention here today and that you'd bring us home. Now this is the invitation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you need to come, won't you come while we sing?